Now, if you're watching this channel, chances are that you are fully aware that there have been many government conspiracies in our lifetime, many cover-ups. There are certain rules that are for the elite and certain rules that are for us, the masses. And unfortunately, when these cover-ups happen, there's usually an innocent life that has been lost in the process. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button and give us a like. If you would like to help support this channel, we do have a link to our Patreon page down below. Also, as always, a special thank you to our producer, Tiffany Monroe, who is a Reiki master here in Atlanta, Georgia. If you would like to get into contact with Tiffany, her email address is also listed down below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today on your bonus Christmas video, we're gonna talk about the hit and run accident of Kevin Showalter. Now, before we get started, I do have to apologize. If my eyes look a little bit swollen, it's because I have been dealing with an ear infection this week. This is not, nothing new to me. I have dealt with ear infections my whole life. I had tubes in my ear as a child. So don't worry, nothing's wrong. It's just, I'm a little bit infected. But let's get started. New London, Connecticut is a seaport town on the northeastern seacoast of the United States of America. Connecticut is one of the original 13 colonies, and this area is known for its whaling enterprise. New London is also known for being the home base of the Coast Guard Academy for the United States. My boyfriend's father was in the Coast Guard, so I'm sure that he spent a lot of time in New London training for his job with the United States military. New London is not a super big town. It's only got about 25,000 people there. I myself grew up in a town with about 25,000 people. It's Again, it's not super small, but it's small enough where most people know each other. In 1973, 20-year-old college student Kevin Showalter was home for the holidays. It was the night of Christmas Eve and Kevin was out with his friend Deborah. Deborah was driving, he was the passenger. Well, on their way home, they got a flat tire. Kevin, being the gentleman that he was, got out of the car to go change the tire. As Kevin was changing the tire, he was hit by an oncoming car. It was technically a hit and run. This unfortunately killed Kevin. Now the ironic thing was he was hit specifically at 11, 11 p.m. Now anybody who knows anything about numerology knows that 11, 11 is a big number. Usually 11, 11 is the sign of war. However, was this just a coincidence or is there more to this story and Kevin's unfortunate hit and run? Well, let's look into it. Because of the holiday, Kevin's mother, Lucille, was unable to go to the police station for a couple of weeks to pick up Kevin's belongings. When she got to the police station, they could not find Kevin's belongings and unfortunately told his mother, Lucille, that there would probably never be any justice for Kevin's case. I mean, what the hell? This isn't a big town. And I'm sure there wasn't a lot of hit and runs happening on Christmas Eve in 1973. Where the hell did Kevin's belongings go? He probably only had like a wallet and maybe a belt, maybe some change in his pockets. Where did they go? And why was the police officer so insistent that there would never be anybody arrested for this homicide of Kevin? like any mother or any human being, they, Lucille was pissed off. So she started to lobby the government, lobby the governor to reopen the investigation into her son's death. And in 1976, three years after Kevin's death, the governor of Connecticut finally decided to open a grand jury to investigate this accident, this hit and run. 
Well, over the course of a year, the state of Connecticut spent over a million dollars investigating what happened to Kevin. This is the most money ever spent up to this point on a hit and run. The investigation found that the new London police had totally botched the investigation by being careless and accidentally losing a lot of Kevin's belongings. For example, they misplaced a lot of green automobile putty that had fallen off the car as well as the signal light that had fallen off the car as well. This is important because when Kevin's body was taken into the hospital, he had flakes of green on his clothes. This could easily have identified who was driving, whose car this was that killed Kevin. But no, the police department lost it. Now, interestingly enough, even though Kevin had the green flakes on his clothes and the putty from the car was missing, the judge in this case, through the investigation, decided that the green flakes had been placed on Kevin's body after the accident. He decided this was done to cover up who the killer actually was. You see, after five months of listening to eyewitness testimonies, 107 people to be exact, the judge decided that the person who had hit Kevin was a wealthy jeweler in the area named Harvey Moloff. Now, the interesting thing about Harvey Moloff is that at one point, he was also the mayor of New London. Of course, Harvey claimed innocence. He said this was not true. In fact, Harvey said that he had droned by the accident site at around 1113, two minutes after the hit. He said that he saw a yellow car parked beside the accident site and that there was a middle-aged man speaking to Deborah. Deborah, of course, said this wasn't true. She said that nobody came to the accident site, no car passed the accident site until 1115 when the ambulance showed up to get Kevin. Well, even though the judge felt like Harvey was responsible for the hit and run of Kevin and was also responsible for covering up the hit and run, he also realized that there was not enough criminal evidence to arrest him. However, this case took another turn in September of 1979 when a man named Paul Hansen confessed to the hit and run. It seems that Paul was an alcoholic and he had been driving drunk that night. He says he has no memory of the actual hit, but he does remember bumping into something and the next morning there was damage done to his car. However, a jury said there was no evidence to back up Paul Hansen's claims. He could have very well been drunk that night and could have very well been driving drunk, but they did not believe that he was responsible for the death of Kevin Showalter. Sadly, in 2005, Paul Hansen committed suicide. In his suicide note, he expressed a lot of guilt over the death of Kevin Showalter. After Paul Hansen's suicide, a local newspaper called The Day of New London newspaper launched an investigation again into Kevin Showalter's death. The transcripts from the original grand jury were sealed in 1978, so the newspaper had to go and ask for these transcripts to be unsealed again. These transcripts were about 12 volumes and consisted of about 3,000 pages. Well, the interesting thing is when they got to the Supreme Court to get these transcripts, they had mysteriously gone missing. Now, in my opinion, Paul Hansen had nothing to do with this accident, this hit and run. Like I said, yes, he could have been driving drunk that night. He could have hit something, but I really don't believe that it was Kevin Showalter. And part of me doesn't believe that Harvey Moloff, the old mayor had anything to do with this either. The reason why I believe the cover-up is even bigger is because of a comment I found on a Reddit chain when I was researching this case. This person on the Reddit chain claimed to be from the area and they said that their parents remembered when this accident happened. It appeared that the Lighthouse Inn, which is a pretty popular place in the area, it's closed now, but there's a lot of history there with the Lighthouse Inn, a lot of ghost stories. Well, anyway, on that night, there was a Christmas party happening, a closed Christmas party with a lot of government officials, including 
the former head of the FBI, L. Patrick Gary III, who is from the area. Now the Lighthouse Inn is less than a mile from the scene of the accident. In my opinion, whoever hit Kevin Showalter was a part of that party at the Lighthouse Inn. I don't know if it was the head of the FBI himself or if it was somebody else. But obviously, if you're that powerful, you have that much power in government, you can magically make things just go away. Unfortunately, to this day, the death of Kevin Showalter still remains a mystery. If Kevin were alive today, he would probably be in his late 60s. He would probably have his own children, his own grandchildren. And it's very heartbreaking that his family had to suffer that loss on such a important family holiday like Christmas. All right, guys, let me know what you think in the comments below. Do you think this was a massive cover up or do you think it was just an accident that never got solved? Let me know your opinions. Don't forget tonight, I will be back on the Dark Outpost to talk about the Book of Thomas with David Zublick. Tomorrow we will do our um, Cliff Notes version of the Book of Thomas for all you guys who are not on the Dark Outpost. But if you would like to join the Dark Outpost to see those conversations weekly, there is a link below. There will also be another video released to you guys on Thursdays as well as our typical Friday video, Friday being Christmas Day. All right, I hope you guys have a wonderful day. I will talk to you soon. Thank you to Josh McKay, as always, for doing our music. If you would like to purchase the song, links down below. And again, thank you so much to Todd Roderick for helping me get this video out to you all on this Tuesday. All right, guys. Bye.